copy of God's Word uh, and turn to Joshua chapter 3. Let's give worship another hand today. Man, what an incredible opportunity uh, for us to worship the same God uh, that we're going to see moving in the life of the children of Israel today. And uh, if you are new here, we have been in a series, whether in person or online, uh, entitled Momentum, Building Spiritual Momentum and Getting Back on Track with God. And, and week one, if you missed it, you can find these online. We talked about the importance from Joshua chapter one of being strong and courageous, whatever you're facing, whatever you're headed, uh, wherever you're headed, uh, whatever you're up against, uh, that God God looked at Joshua and the children of Israel, both singular and plural, and he said, be strong and courageous. Last week, we looked at uh, Joshua chapter 2 and the story of Rahab, uh, the prostitute, Rahab, the harlot. And what we said last week is it reminds us of this clear fact that others may disqualify you from being used by God. Sometimes because we know our past, we disqualify ourselves, but God never disqualifies anyone. From his love and his grace, and he can still use you. And so here we are today in Joshua chapter 3. The children of Israel are preparing to enter the promised land. And now in Joshua chapter 3 and 4, we're actually going to see them move into the promised land. And so I want to talk to us today on this third idea of, as we develop momentum, be strong and courageous. Uh, man, don't ever let anyone disqualify you from being used by God. Today, learning to take steps of faith. And if we're really going to be where God wants us to be and do what God wants us to do, we all have to learn to take steps of faith. We have to move from where we are to where God wants us to be. And there's really a clear pattern in Joshua chapter 3 and 4 that we're really, really going to see how we can take how God moved in their life and how they moved into the promised land and how you and I can take those same steps, apply them into our life, and move from where we are to where God wants us to be. Now, my guess is uh, uh, there are some in this room that you've been in this place before. You've perhaps been in a new year or you've been in a place in your spiritual journey or maybe there's someone online and you are sitting here going, you know, I've never really taken steps of faith with God. I've heard about them. I've thought about them. I've talked about them. But I've never really done it. And so you think, man, for me to really, God, uh, Pastor, for me to really step up for God, Pastor, that this whole steps of faith, making commitment, taking action, studying God's Word, this is all going to be very, very new for me. Can I just remind you that we serve a God who likes new things? How many of you know that? I mean, just think about it. Go back to eternity past when it's just God, right? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they're fine in their relationship with the Trinity. But then God says, I want to do something new. And we're told that in God's heart, in God's mind, he says, you know what, I, I, I want to create a world. But I don't just want to create any world. I want to create a world with a universe. I'm going to put stars in the sky, and I'm going to put stars close, and I'm going to put stars a long, long, long way away. So as they develop uh, uh, and grow, as, as the people I put on this world, as they begin to look further and further into space, they're going to see more and more detail and they're never going to run out of new discoveries to find. And so God created this new universe and this new space and this new earth. And God looked at this earth and he said, man, I want to create some brand new waters and some brand new land. And he says, that's good. Look at it. Genesis chapter one. And then the Lord said it was good. But God said, I'm not done there. I, I want to on this earth, on this world that I create, I want to create something new called animals. And so God creates all of these animals and it says it was good. But God said, man, this amazing universe doesn't need to be held just for me or just for the animals. So he created you and me. He created humanity brand new in his image. It says he created the male and female and he blessed them brand new. Our God is a God who loves new. So if you are standing here today or you're viewing in online and you're saying, Pastor, this is really going to be new for me, let me just remind you, we serve a God who looks forward to your new. Go, go look at what Isaiah said. 
Isaiah said through God, he quotes God, the Lord said, stop looking at the former things. He says, instead, I want to do something new in your life. Some of us are struggling with the idea of taking steps of faith with God because we are looking at our past. We are looking at our failures. Can I encourage you with this, that God wants to do something new. Or jump over to Ezekiel, where the Lord speaks through Ezekiel to the people, and he goes, some of you, you've had a heart of stone for a long, long time. And God says, I want to exchange your heart of stone for a new heart and a new spirit. So maybe there are some in this room that, man, you've just become so hardened to the gospel, so hardened to the challenge of moving forward in your faith that you feel like your heart is made of stone. Can I tell you this? That God wants to take that stone heart, young man or young woman, married or single, and he wants to exchange your heart of stone for a new heart and a new spirit. Some of you perhaps are sitting in here and you are struggling so much that to think about taking steps with God, you're just broken hearted because of some loss or some failure or some struggle in your life. And you say, man, I, I just need something new. Just go read the Psalms. How many times in the Psalms that God says, you know what, I'm, I'm kind of tired of you singing that same old song. So what does it say in the psalm? I, I want to put a new song in your heart and new words on your mouth. We, we did a new song today, didn't we? How many of you know it's good to sing new songs? See, because God is all about the new. Man, fast forward to the New Testament. Remember what Jesus did in that upper room after he had instituted the Lord's Supper? He knelt down, he washed the disciples' feet. And in John chapter 13, he looked at them. And he said, a new commandment I give to you. How many remember? That you love one another. He says, by this, the whole world will know you are my disciples. Because you love one another. Go back into the Old Testament. Maybe there's some here that you just feel like, man, but pastor, you have no idea what I've done and the failures I've had and the mistake I keep making over and over and over again. And go read Lamentations chapter 3 where God, through Jeremiah, says, don't ever forget, my mercies are what? New every day. Fast forward to the New Testament where Jesus is instituting that Lord's Supper. And he's thinking about his body about to be nailed on that cross and his blood that he's about to shed. Do you remember what he said when he looked at the cup? He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Man, we serve a God of the new covenant. Fast forward, not only does the Bible begin with new, it ends with the new. Revelation 21, where God says, you know what? The old things are going to pass away. Behold, I am making all things new. So child of God, wherever you are in your station in life, and your, your space in life, if you are sitting here going, Pastor, I've heard this before, but I've really never taken these steps, and this is going to be very new for me. Can I tell you, we serve a God who loves new. And see, in this whole story in the book of Joshua is about, about God taking the children of Israel from bonding in Egypt, from wandering around into the desert, and into the promised land. And that's new. But I want you to know there are a lot of you that you've been wandering in the desert or you've been bound in bondage for a long, long time. Can I remind you of this? God doesn't want you where you are. He wants you to take, space, take steps of faith to be where he wants you to be.
Let's jump down kind of into the middle of the story. Uh, Joshua chapter 3, it's the story of the children of Israel going to the promised land. And literally, I want to go dead in the middle. When I say dead in the middle of the story, I'm like in the middle of the Jordan. Here it is, all right? Verse 17, pick it up. It says, The priest who carried the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan. Everybody say middle of the Jordan. We're in the middle of the story. So they've taken steps to get there, but even being in the middle of the Jordan is not the end of the story. Maybe some of you have taken some very clear, miraculous steps of faith, and God has moved in your life. But I want you to know, they're still not in. This is the middle of the story. All right, so here it is. It says, they stood on dry ground while all of Israel passed by until the whole nation, listen to this, completed crossing on dry ground. How many of you know that takes commitment? All right, we're going to read here in a few seconds that the Jordan was at, uh, it was harvest time, which means it was at flood stage, that uh, God looked at Joshua and said, listen, send the ark and the priest into the promised land. Now, I'm not going to dry up the water. I'm not going to perform the miracle until you make a commitment. Everybody say commitment. That's what it's going to require. Why is it so important that you and I are willing today, as we take steps of faith, be willing to make commitments? Well, first of all, because commitments have power. They shape our lives. Man, I don't know if you went to college or not, but if you chose a major, whatever your major was, that was a commitment. How many of you know that? That kind of set you on a path and a direction. Now, here's what we know. Many people, even though they made that commitment, studied something in college or didn't study something, you're, you're probably not doing exactly what you studied for. But that commitment began to drive you in a certain direction. Commitments literally shape our lives. How many of you are married? How many of you know that's kind of a commitment, right? How many of you know that is a commitment that will shape your life? Men, how many of you are married to the woman that constantly shapes your life, right? Everything you say, everything you do, how you act, what you shouldn't do, right? Man, commitments shape us. How many of you have kids? How many of you have too many? No, I'm kidding. How many commitments shape your life, right? You have kids, and then you're like, man, all of a sudden, I thought I was going to do this, but we're going to do this, and then this was going to happen, and that was, man, our lives, when we decide to have children, man, that is a commitment that will shape our, commitments are powerful. And so if you and I are willing to, regardless of where you've been, if you're willing to make some commitments today to take some steps of faith, to take you into the dry ground, in the Jordan, but ultimately into the promised land, God will honor them. But not only are our commitments, listen to this, not only are they powerful, I want to remind everybody in this room, our commitments are limited. You can't commit to everyone, everything. How many of you know that? You can't commit to everything. That, that every time you make a commitment to something, it keeps you from making a commitment to something else. Every time. And some of you, as you think about taking steps of faith for God and making that commitment, one of the things that's going to hinder you or keep you from making the kind of commitment that God wants you to be is because you've made a lot of other commitments. That here's the best thing you can do is you need to step back and kind of do an internal spiritual audit of where you spend your time, where you spend your energy, what relationships you pour into, what's important in your life. And we might need to unwind out of some commitments that we make, we've made, because they're just not that important. I heard someone say that life is kind of like a buffet. And the last thing you want to do is get to the end of the line and have your plate filled with the wrong stuff. Anybody ever in here, you've started out at a buffet and you've loaded up and all of a sudden you get to the end, everybody's smirking and smiling. And you go, dang, I got no space for that, right? And then it's a buffet, so you get a second plate. <laughs> right? Hey, can I tell you in your life you get one plate? Fill it carefully. Put the right stuff on it. And I want to tell you, if you'll make a commitment to God to walk with Him in a new way, in a new space, with new commitments, you will never, ever ever regret it. Man, our commitments are powerful. They shape our lives. So, all right, 
you say, Pastor, what are some commitments that I need to make as we begin to journey through this thought process of how to take steps of faith? Let's just look at them. We're going to pull them straight out of God's Word. Step number one is you need clear instructions. You need clear instructions. We're going to talk about them today. What are the things that you need to know? What are the commitments you need to make? Let's pick up the clear instructions. Pick it up in verse 2. This is uh, Joshua and the leaders of Israel beginning to talk to the children of Israel. So if we're the children of Israel, and this is the Jordan, the promised land is right there. So here's what it says. It says, after three days, the officers went throughout the camp, talking to everybody, giving orders to the people. These are the clear instructions. What are the instructions? When, listen to this, when you see, everybody say see. When you see what God wants you to see, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the Levitical priest carrying it, you will move out. Everybody say move out. So I want to see what God wants me to see. Then after I see it, I want to move out. Notice, then you want to move out from your positions where you are and follow it. So here's where you are. You've made a commitment to be where you are spiritually. To in every area and space of your life, you've made a commitment. And notice what it says here. You've made a commitment to be where you are, to be in that position. So if we're going to move to take a step of faith, to be where God wants us to be, I have to see the right things. I have to hear the instructions. I have to know what God wants me to follow and how God wants me to live. But then I need to be willing to take some action and move out from my current position and follow it. Now notice verse 4. Then, everybody say then. See, a lot of times what we want in seasons like this, in stations like this, we want to sit here and say, God, I want to walk with you. I want to follow you. I want to take steps of faith. And then we look at God and say, you first. And God says, no, no, no. All my cards are on the table. I've sent my son. I, I, I've offered you grace. I've offered you love. I've offered you forgiveness. My cards are on the table. A lot of times we look at God and say, you first. But we're going to see through this whole story that God just looks at the children of Israel and says, you're there, Jordan here, promised land there. Are you willing to see, to move out and go into the promised land? If you will, then that's where that word comes in, verse 4. Then God will move. He says, then you will know which way to go since you have never been this way before. Some of us. I truly believe some of you, there's some men in this room, there's some men viewing online, that you are going to go further with God this, this year than you've ever gone before. You're going to go places where you've never been before with God. There are some ladies in this room that you're going to make some commitments this year in your relationships, in your spiritual journey, that you're going to go further with God this year than you've ever gone before. You're going to go to places you've never been before. I mean, that is a powerful thing. And so I love what, the, what you see here, the imagery, the children of Israel, the priest carrying the Ark of the Covenant through the Jordan River into the Promised Land. You say, why, Pastor, is the Ark of the Covenant so important? Uh, I, I don't know if you know what the Ark of the Covenant is. We've got a picture for it. Uh, but the Ark of the Covenant is always significant in the life of the children of Israel. And so you'll see the image there. You say, Pastor, what was in the Ark? Well, everybody knows the answer to that, right? It was a glowing ball that melts Nazis' faces, right? Y'all remember, that's straight out of the Bible, right? That is not what was in the ark, okay? There were three things that were in the ark, and we always got to know, because everything in the ark reminds us of something about God. See, when the children of Israel looked at that ark, they saw the power and the presence and the provision of God. One of the things that was in the ark was the manna. Remember the manna when the children of Israel had chosen uh, not to go into the promised land, but instead they chose to wander around in the wilderness. And some of us have chosen that for a long, long time. But it says God still provided manna for the children of Israel. You say, Pastor, there was manna in there? Yeah, in a, in a gold dish, there was manna in there. You say, Pastor, what is manna? We don't really know. Matter of fact, you might want to open your app and write this down. You know what the exact definition of or translation of that Hebrew word manna is? It's what is it? That when the children of Israel saw it, they said, what is it? All right? 
So maybe you can use that at lunch today. When someone serves you something, you just go, manna? Right? It just simply means, what? say, why did they put the manna in there? To remind them that even in their disobedience, that God is still a providing God. Now, let me tell you what. In their obedience, he'll be a greater provider in the promised land. So, child of God, every time they looked at that Ark of the Covenant, they were reminded that God fed us even in our disobedience. The second thing was in there. Well, the tablets of stone, those Ten Commandments, you can go read about those in Exodus chapter 19 and Exodus chapter 20. Those ten tablets of stone where God showed up to Moses up on the mountain and he etched in stone these Ten Commandments. They said, listen, when you go into the promised land, this is how the children of Israel are to treat each other. And the first table of, uh, of the Ten Commandments talk about a relationship with God. And the next uh, few commandments talk about a relationship with others. And every time they look at the ark, they knew that those stone tablets, even though Moses wasn't still with them as they go into the promised land, those stone tablets were in that Ark of the Covenant. And they would always remember as they thought about it, they would say, man, you should have no other gods before me. Do not make for yourselves any graven image. Don't ever take the Lord's name in vain. Uh, remember uh, the Sabbath and keep it holy. Honor your father and mother, kids, so that your days may be long in the land. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not covet. Man, every time they looked at that ark, it reminded them, not just individually, but as a community of faith, how they should live when they went into the promised land. Good challenge for us, that God is our provider. But also, God has a standard of holiness that you and I can't meet. I'm going to circle back to that here in a second. The third thing, that as you looked in the ark of the covenant, it was Aaron's rod. You say, why Aaron's rod? Well, you think about that rod, uh, what it was used for. If you just go back in the deliverance of the children of Israel from Egypt. Man, when the sorcerers of Pharaoh began to do their little magical tricks and, and they brought and made staffs into snakes, it was Aaron's rod that he dropped it and it turned into a bigger snake and a badder snake. And it ate their snake and those children of Israel knew that. And then you go a little further when the plague, when, when all of a sudden God wanted to turn the waters of the Nile uh, into red. It was Aaron's staff that touched the water. A little later, when you go to another plague and God wanted to bring about frogs and gnats, it was Aaron's staff. So let me tell you what, the children of Israel understood the manna talked about God's provision. The table talked about God's holiness. But Aaron's rod talked about God's power. But it really is not the eating of the snakes or the Nile to red or the gnats and the frog as to why that staff is in that ark. Fast forward to Numbers chapter 17. And the children of Israel were beginning to grumble again. How many of you know they like to do that a lot? They're not a lot, lot, lot different than we are. So it says the children of Israel went to Moses and said, who are you? And they went to Aaron, who was the priest at that time, who was delivering God's word to them and God's message to them over and over again. And they looked at him and said, who are you? And kind of the leaders of the tribe said, you know, we really don't want to follow you guys anymore. And Moses said, I got an idea. Let's just, let's just have a test. And so we looked at all the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. You can read this in Numbers chapter 17. Said, I got an idea. Bring, bring your leader's staff. Each one of the tribes, by the way, you had all of these 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Aaron was one of them, the priest of the Levites. All right. And, and they came and they brought their leader who had a staff. And Moses said, here's what we're going to do. Let's lay all the staffs down here. And I don't want to choose Aaron. Let's see who God chooses. So they put all the staffs down. It says they went away. They came back the next morning. All the other staffs look exactly the same except for Aaron's staff that had begun to bud and had flowers and had fruit on it. And Moses said, look for yourself. God has chosen him. When he speaks, we listen. And so here's what you see. When the children of Israel saw that Ark of the Covenant, 
They saw that Aaron was the leader. God's power and presence was with them. God was calling them from Egypt, from the desert, into a promised land. They saw God's provision. They saw God's holiness. Everything in the ark spoke powerfully to them. But can I tell you this? The most important thing about that ark was not those three things that were in the ark. It was a seat on top of the ark. See, on top of the ark was the covering. And it's called the mercy seat. How many of you are grateful for the mercy seat? See, because the children of Israel were reminded of what's in the ark, reminded them that they were not worthy of God's provision. They were not worthy of God's holiness. They weren't worthy of God's power and God's leadership. But that mercy seat with those two cherubim on top reminded them that once a year the priest would go in and offer a sacrifice for the sins of the people. Now they also understood that, that those sacrifices were just foreshadowing of the one sacrifice. Jesus Christ who would come and die on the cross for their sins, your sins and my sins. And as you just track that Ark of the Covenant, as the children of Israel were walking around in the promised land, there, there was something called the tabernacle. where It was kind of a traveling worship center. And so they would pick it up and move it, and they'd pick it up and move it, and there were special instructions on who could carry this ark and who couldn't carry this ark. But wherever the tabernacle was set up, there would be the Holy of Holies. The only thing in the Holy of Holies was this Ark of the Covenant, and the most important part of this Ark of the Covenant was the mercy seat on top. If you travel from the tabernacle into Solomon's day, when Solomon built a temple, in that temple there was a holy of holies, and this ark was there. And once a year, the high priest could go in. And the people couldn't, and they would make a sacrifice on this mercy seat. Fast forward to the New Testament. Remember when Jesus died on the cross? And it said the veil in the temple was rent from top to bottom that that veil that separated the people from God was torn. Why? Because the great high priest had shed his blood once for all for the sins of the world. So when the children of Israel looked at that Ark of the Covenant, they knew that God is screaming about his provision, his power, his leadership, but also his mercy. And so wherever you are today, I want you to know, here are those clear instructions. The invitation for everyone in this room and everyone online is see the ark and the grace of God. Listen to his instructions. Stand up and move out from your position. And then God is going to show some of us a new space and a new place in walking in our relationship with Him than we've ever known before. So number one, know your clear instructions. Here's number two, look at it. Man, you have to consecrate yourselves. You say, so pastor, I can just take all my sins and everything that I do, all my bad habits, and God will just use me in spite. No, no. Notice the pause here, verse 5. Joshua told the people, all right, said, listen, look, notice the ark, all of this stuff. He says, consecrate yourselves. You say, pastor, what does that mean? I'm just going to put it right there where you, we can all see it. Here's what it simply means. To consecrate, that Hebrew word consecrate, means to devote dedicate or give over your life to the service of God. That that means if we're going to con consecrate ourselves, that we just need to right now say, God, I'm going to give myself to you. There are some things in my life that don't honor you. They don't please you. There are some bad habits. There are some difficulties. There are some relationships in my life that don't honor you. And I'm going to get rid of those, and I'm going to dedicate my life to you. Now, notice again, do this, and notice what happens tomorrow. So let's read verse 5. It says, Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow God will do something amazing among you. There's the pattern. You do this, then God will do this. You do this, God will do this. So as you are sitting there, maybe in your app or maybe in your notes on your phone, Man, what are some things in your life when we think about our commitments that are limited, that keep us from serving God? 
What are some things in your life that you made commitments to that you need to undo? That you need to consecrate your calendar and say, you know what? I don't know why I have that on my calendar. I don't need to have that on my calendar. Maybe there's some habits. Maybe there's some things you say, things you do, man, that keep you from serving God. Because that word consecrate simply means to devote or dedicate oneself or utensil. You can even do it, and you see in the Old Testament, they would dedicate certain utensils to the service of God. Maybe as a goblet or something for, for the wine or, or for something to drink for the high priest. That's just a dedication. What do you need to consecrate yourself to? What do you need to get rid of to be the kind of servant God ultimately wants you to be? Here's number three. You ready? So number one is I need to hear my instruction. Number two, I need to consecrate myself. Uh, maybe my time, my schedule, reduce some commitments. Here's number three. We need to constantly listen to God's word. We need to constantly be allowing ourselves to hear and listen to God's word. You say, where do you see that? Pick it up in verse 9. Joshua said to the Israelites, come here. Might want to just underline that. That's plural. Come here, all of us, and listen to the words of the Lord your God. When you think about that in the Hebrew, and we talked about this in, in Joshua chapter 1, it is so important. For you and me, for us as children of God, to read and study God's Word individually. But I want you to know when you look in God's Word, it is just as important for us to gather here corporately, plurally, as a group, and listen to God's Word. And so he says, hey, come here and listen to the, to the words of the Lord your God. Look at verse 10. This is how you will know that the living God is among you. There it is, plural again. So notice, this is how you're going to know God is among you. Here it is. It says, and that he will certainly drive out before you all the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, uh, the Girgashites, the Amorites, the Jebusites. That, anybody have any enemies like that? They just have different, different names? Here's what he says. He says, listen, if you'll listen to my word, all those problems, that, that they're not named those, all those struggles that you have, God says, I'll drive them out. But you have to hear the instruction. You have to consecrate yourself. And then you have to listen to my word. And then God promises, I'll drive them out before you. Look at verse 11. Then again, he reminds them, see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth. He will go into the Jordan ahead of you. Man, God says... If you're just willing to say yes and take some steps of faith, God will go before you. God's not going to leave you stranded. Not, God's not going to hang you out to dry. God's going to go with you. And so here's number four. All right. So I've heard the instructions. I've consecrated myself. I've listened to God's word. And here's the next step. I've got to take action. What action steps are you going to start taking today? The most common thing, I, I think, as I talk to people, whether, whether it's men or couples in their relationship or whatever, that we'll talk about, and, and most people know what they need to do. Don't we? I mean, honestly, it's the doing. My guess is many of you right now are already saying, you know what, I, I, just, need to, I just need to stop this. I need to get rid of this sin. I, I need to make a commitment to get in a group to do this. I, you know what? Um, they talk about it. We do every time. Every spiritual growth campaign. We have four a year here at the church. Every time. We encourage you to text PLAN to 77978 so we will send you a Bible passage each and every day. We will send you a devotion every day. It's important for you to get that individually but also know collectively. As a group, we're also studying God's Word together. There are some of you, you know what to do. So I'm going to encourage us. Men, let's take action. Ladies, let's take action. Singles, married, young people, let's put it into practice. Let's take some action. That's step number four. Look at it in verse 14. It says, so when the people broke camp, everybody say broke camp. Here's what that means in their day. They took their tents, they folded them up. They packed them up, got them ready to move. They, they took the tent pegs out of the ground. Why? 
because they were simply saying, we're not staying here, we're going there. The children of Israel, before they ever entered the promised land, they packed their bags, right? So child of God, here's what I want you to know. Make a commitment in your mind to take action when you leave, to pack your bags. God is going to take you somewhere. You didn't expect him to go. Or you didn't expect to go. And here's what we can say. It doesn't say they left their tents over there, so should the water not part. It didn't say, well, they didn't want to pack everything just in case it didn't go so well. It says they packed everything up. It says, so when the people broke camp to cross the Jordan, the priests carry, and notice again, the Ark of the Covenant. God's provision, God's leadership, God's power, God's word, the mercy seat, God's grace. Over again, it says they broke the camp. The Ark of the Covenant went ahead of them. Look at verse 15. And the Jordan was at flood stage during harvest. Yet as soon, not before, as soon as the priest who carried the Ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched. Everybody say touched. See, we can hear the instruction if we wanted to. We could consecrate ourselves. We could read God's word. But if we're not willing to take the step of faith, the miracle doesn't happen. Does that make sense? I think some of us have heard the instructions many times. We've said, oh, God, I know I need to get rid of this, this commitment I need to get rid of. I need to change the sin, change this habit. I've read God's word, but we've never stepped into the water. And that's what we see here. It says, yet as soon as the priest who carried the ark, there it is again, reached the Jordan, their feet touched the water's edge. It says, the waters from upstream stopped flowing, so the people crossed over opposite of Jericho. And you sit here and go, finally, after 700 years, From the promise to Abram through Egypt, through the wilderness wandering, finally, they just trusted God enough to step into the water. I mean, it just boggles my mind. Do you ever just sit here and think back on the children of Israel and say, it boggles my mind with all that God did that they didn't go into the promised land the first time? How many of you are honest? Let's be honest. Let's condemn them just a little bit, right? (laughs) Let's judge. But we don't want to do that because if we're honest with ourselves, how many of us have come to a watershed moment in your faith, in your marriage, with your kids, with your life, and you've backed away? Your pastor asks. Everyone on this staff at some point has. Every deacon who serves you each and every day, we've all had those moments. Life group teachers. But the beauty of God's mercy seat is that His mercies are new every day. So all we have to do is step in by faith, and the waters will dry out. You say, Pastor, what's the fifth step? When God gives you the victory, celebrate it. How many of you like to celebrate just a little bit? Because I want to get you out to the taste of gotten wood. I'm not going to read this, but I'll leave you two passages in your insert. When the children of Israel went into the promised land, they celebrated with two memorials. Everybody say two. One of the memorials, you can read the first one I'll put in your insert. It's the children children of Israel when they crossed through. The priests were there. They were holding the Ark of the Covenant. The water dried up that Joshua came back in, stood by those priests, gathered up 12 stones, built an altar under the Jordan. And it says it's still there today. What does that mean? It says when the priest walked out, that altar was overrun by water. Do we understand that? That is an unseen altar. I'll just submit to you that they're very important. You say, why would someone build an altar? It says where the place where the priest stood, that you know the water's just going to overwhelm it. 
I think the reminder for us today is in everybody's heart, there ought to be that invisible, unseen, hidden memorial that I am totally and completely committed to God whether others can see it or not. But there's also a seen altar, and this is where it really applies to all of us. It says in Joshua chapter 4, it says, and then not only did Joshua say we're going to build an altar right here, he looked at the 12 leaders of the children of Israel and said, everybody go get a stone from the midst of the Jordan. So they crawl down in the Jordan, all 12 leaders of the tribe walk up. They go to a place called Gilgal. Everybody say Gilgal. It's where they camped waiting before they attacked Jericho. We'll see that. Follow the story here in a couple of weeks. So it says they built an altar there at Gilgal. Now God didn't tell them to stay at Gilgal. He says, I want you to go in and possess the land. I want you to possess Jericho and Judea and all of those places. And you say, well, 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 Joshua, why would we build an altar at Gilgal? This isn't even where we're going to live. Here was his response. Because there's going to come a day when you're walking with your kids and you happen to journey through Gilgal. And they're going to say, Dad... Look at that pile of stones. And dad, you're going to look at your son and you're going to say, that's not a pile of stone. That's a memorial where we celebrated God's victory. And there's some moms in this room that you're going to be walking with your daughters someday in certain spaces and certain places. And you're going, what's that pile of stone? That was a decision that I made years ago that brought about God's victory and God's grace. And then Joshua said, and not only is that a memorial of God's power and provision and leadership in your life, to your children, go read it. He says, but also to your grandchildren and to their children and to their children. So the invitation for all of us today, whether you're in this room or whether you're online, is let's build an altar today. That our kids and our grandkids can hear about. You mean dad, literally. January of 2023, that's when he said, I'm all in. That's when he said it. And here's what it looked like. And here's what happened afterwards. And I love this. And when your grandkids say, and your great-grandkids say, and your great-grandkids say, what's this? That was the day. Now, beyond that, read just a little. I put it in your notes. And then Joshua said, all right, by the way, it's not just for your kids. Listen to this. This is the call of the church. This is the call of the church. Joshua said, it's not just for your kids and your grandkids and your great-grandkids, but the altar that we build to God with our own lives and with our church, read it. He says, is for all people. That means as Chase talked a little bit about praying and serving alongside for D now with a thousand kids going to show up. That means some of you here might provide some food for some kid you don't even know. That's an altar of your faithfulness. And God will use it. So child of God, as we close today, we go in the promised land together. We build altars that are unseen through faith, but we also build them that are seen. The question for you is, are you willing to go? Let's pray. God, thank you so much for your love and your grace. God, thank you for the Ark of the Covenant that reminds us of your provision for us even when we're unworthy, your holiness that we can't even touch, your leadership when we're even unaware but God, also your mercy seat that reminds us that you forgive us even when we're unforgivable. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen.